everyone, welcome to another episode of Islamabad Today on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we're going to be speaking about governance, innovation, and reforms. How can government policy making have a trickle-down effect on local populations? And how do innovative techniques, strategies, and you could say different ideas can try and assist the government in trying to make sure that policy making has that effect on local populations? And we do see this great divide between the population as well as government policy making. And what are the areas that can act as bridges to try and make sure that we can actually address this divide? I have with me member of the Governance, Innovation and Reforms at the Planning Commission of Pakistan, Mr. Adnan Rafiq. Mr. Adnan Rafiq, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's talk about innovation and reforms and governance. Why do you think it's necessary to make sure that you could say governance can actually be, you know, reformed to a large extent, what sort of innovative techniques can actually be implemented to try and make sure that those ends can be met? So a lot of people see Pakistan as a country that is very difficult to govern. And I think primarily the perception arises from the fact that Pakistan is a very diverse country. It has geographic diversity. Uh, it has social uh, diversity. Uh, it has, um, you know, economic inequality. So if you look at it, we have all sort of socio-economic fault lines. So we have, uh, you know, ethnic divide. There's a religious uh, divide, then urban, rural, gender gap. Uh, we have it all. And also, uh, if you look at the geography, uh, right from a very difficult mountainous uh, terrain down to the deserts um, and so on, uh, it's a, it's, 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 you know, it's a mix. Um, and then we are in a neighborhood, you know, that has been fraught with uh, different sort of um, geopolitical and global problems. Uh, we look at Afghanistan, you look at uh, Iran, and, and then we have been fraught with, uh, you know, complicated relationship on our eastern border with India. So if you look at all the mix of things, uh, you know, there, there are uh, challenges. And, and um, as a result, um, you know, in the last 70, 75 years, I think our governance system has been evolving and uh, it's still work in progress, which is why it's extremely important that we keep an eye on the ball. Uh, we co make continuous um, uh, efforts to incrementally, but surely uh, improve our governance system. And uh, to answer your question, question more specifically, look, the world has changed. In Pakistan, we have a new generation. We have new demographics. We have a completely different Pakistan today than we had even 20 years ago. And this new Pakistan demands a very different approach to governance, um, a very different uh, sort of service delivery. And uh, uh, the state uh, ought to respond to these emerging needs. Uh, which is why I think governance is central to uh, to 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 our um, societal life and uh, for the future of our nation. Okay, so give us some examples of the kind of innovative techniques that actually need to be implemented to try and make sure that governance models can be more, you could say, public responsive or society responsive. I think you know I'll you know a lot of people talk about IT and tech and all that I'll come to that but in the latter half perhaps I think the more essential uh, bit that we need to have in our governance is um, a politics of consensus or or governing with consensus which means an inclusive approach where people are duly represented uh, proportionally uh, in the power structure where people have a say and have a voice in deciding uh, uh, various uh, policies which affect their lives. And that is absolutely critical. And I think we made some progress in this respect uh, since the 18th Amendment, because that uh, transferred a lot of powers to the provinces where it should belong. And, uh, you know, it kind of uh, strengthen, uh, strengthened our uh, federalism. Now, that leaves us obviously with enormous coordination challenges, as we saw that when we had the COVID pandemic or the floods uh, during the last year, uh, that needed an integrated, coordinated response. And uh, I think we are evolving models like the NCOC or the NFRCC 
where all stakeholders were brought together on one platform to provide that integrated and coordinated response that these enormous challenges required. So again, these two are good examples of how a consultative inclusive approach can be adopted to govern the country. Now, this needs to go beyond the provinces as well, and we need to have a third year of governance through local governments so that we can complete uh, this uh, the, the political space where people, communities can have their say and can decide for themselves. So I think that is the critical bit which is still missing in this regard. Second uh, is uh, the modes of service delivery. Again, we've had a political system and culture uh, where we have relied on what we call the politics of patronage, which means right. that you know, if we need to get some work done, you will rely on your friend or family or someone within the power hierarchy who will facilitate uh, your, uh, you know, uh, whatever you need to get done, uh, even if it's completely legitimate and 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 uh, and your right to have. But even for uh, getting basic services, uh, service delivery, whether it's justice and security whether it's just boarding a flight uh, you know on 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 the national flag area um, you will have instances where you will have to call up someone and someone will uh, as a favor facilitate you right this this has been our culture um, now this needs to shift from the culture or the politics of patronage uh, which is trading favors to a politics of service delivery where the political players accrue the, the political capital by providing good, efficient, effective services, rather than through this informal system of uh, uh, you know, uh, delivering patronage. So I think that is absolutely key, uh, significant shift that we need. And this is the only way uh, through which we'll be able to provide services indiscriminately, irrespective of who's the recipient. We have to raise our service standards and, and, and some good examples exist where we have achieved it. So you take the example of motorway police. Uh, it's a good example to see where everyone is treated the same way, same rules apply to everyone. You cannot escape. Uh, if you make a mistake, you know, you will have to pay the fine as well. If you need assistance, you will get assistance as uh, like the same way as anyone else. Nadra is another example where you go to any Nadra center, there is a process, you will have to follow the queue, you will get your services. So I think uh, double one, double two, you know, the rescue service again has, has done a phenomenal job. So I think we have these uh, examples that we need to build upon and expand so that the all public service delivery is rules-based and is efficient and effective and provides services to all citizens, irrespective of uh, any needs for asking favor or anything. So that's uh, the second thing. And in order to achieve this, of course, technology has a major role because this is only possible when we move uh, from a service delivery model, which is more outcome-centric, then the outcomes centric. So we have to move from um, laying down our key performance uh, indicators within the public sector, uh, which uh, from uh, just outputs. Uh, so uh, for example, if we are building a school, uh, generally the KPIs we look at is whether the building has been constructed, whether it's been furnished, whether we have teachers and whether we have now a running uh, school or not, what we do not often look at are the learning outcomes that we are achieving by the provision of that whole infrastructure and, and, and uh, human resource. So we have to shift from output-centric uh, service delivery to outcome-centric service delivery. And uh, in order to enable that, you need transparency, you need uh, evidence-based policy making and technology is a key tool that we can use to leverage, that we need to leverage in order to achieve this, right? So I'm very clear in that, that IT is, you know, as someone said, even in the governance forum that you mentioned, that 
the tools of governance have changed from the paper and pen to you know tech and you know with now in artificial intelligence coming in and uh, you know it has become digital uh, and therefore we need to incorporate digital technologies as much as possible um, to to achieve the the ends that i just mentioned all right so one of the key tools is e governance when we talk about e governance it's to try and make sure that services can actually be expedited to the general public and uh, one of the keys regarding e governance is to try and make sure that bureaucratic inertia are actually tackled but if you take a look at the majority of Pakistanis who actually need to get registered, they need a, a few government services with regard to, um, you know, even possible criminal complaints. They do complain of a lot of bureaucratic inertia, which are actually taking place. So do you think that this is a major hurdle? And if yes, then what needs to be done to tackle that? Absolutely. I mean, look, the state institutions in Pakistan were established during the British colonial age. And even then, they were established with a sole uh, purview of uh, subjugating the people, not necessarily to serve the people. Uh, a good example is, is the police, which was established along the Irish constabulary model rather than the metropolitan policing model, um, even at that time. So therefore, uh, we've had, you know, sort of a post-colonial state institutions that are not really geared to 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 serve the people uh, and 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 they have you know a lot of um, inertia as you said and rigidity when it comes to um, you know uh, achieving the objectives that they ought to achieve and i think there will be an incremental process through which this needs to be changed the most important thing uh, in bringing about any change is to achieve stakeholder consensus right and in pakistan uh, that has been lacking, frankly. And in order to push uh, relevant stakeholders to agree on, for example, civil service reforms, which is which would be absolutely key to these things. Right now, our civil service uh, lacks any sort of genuine uh, or effective performance management. It lacks, uh, you know, even uh, specialization in various fields. Uh, we rely too much on generalists. Uh, who lead policy making exercises in uh, in their respective uh, domains uh, then we also uh, need the right incentives uh, as i said uh, for them to perform they are generally overworked poorly paid and uh, not supported uh, as uh, as much as they should be so uh, i think we we need quite a, a major overhaul of the whole uh, civil service system, right from the recruitment and induction down to their performance progression, their, their career progression, performance management, and the retirement and, and the incentive structure that, uh, that they have. And uh, in order, in order to, to meet, uh, you know, the, in order to respond to, to the uh, aspirations that the citizens now have, and this is a tall order, right? So I think no one should be under the illusion that this can be done in 90 days or it can be done overnight. Uh, this will be a slow process. As I said, uh, there are, as a few examples I mentioned, give you to give you another example, Pakistan Customs um, recently uh, installed, just like we are having this uh, conversation over Zoom. So they, they started a Zoom, uh, they, they established a Zoom system over which uh, the businessmen or the importers, exporters, they could they could have their meetings with the customer customs officials through Zoom rather than going all the way to their office, waiting in queues and you know all of that. So they created an online system where you can book your appointment, you use your CNIC number. If you miss two appointments, that means you don't show up without rescheduling it. Third time, the system won't allow you to book, and you will have to go to their office. But it worked uh, fantastically. So I think uh, similarly, we need to incorporate uh, emerging technologies uh, to facilitate the citizens. And what's important for the power elites to understand is that uh, now with 250 million people, this is a more sure, uh, short way for them to uh, serve the citizens and get the political dividends. 
rather than the the informal uh, favor or the trading system or the patronage based system that that has been uh, in operation so so this is where i see that you know gradually incrementally we'll be able to um, improve uh, our service delivery much of this also has to do with digital literacy and uh, you know the population being well aware of how to use softwares and applications and you know online databases to try and suit their needs do you think that there needs to be more training of the local population as to what digital literacy is? I'll come to the perils of digital literacy uh, later and digitalization later. But with regard to literacy, do you think that there needs to be more training programs that can actually make sure that the population is made well aware of how to digitally get work done? I think, of course, uh, one has to uh, consider uh, the digital divide and make sure that those who are not uh, who do not have digital literacy um, due to various factors uh, they are not excluded right so you always have to cater to all citizens irrespective of their ability uh, to access uh, public services through technology or not however there is an expanding constituency of course with the advent of a touch screen phone you know a lot of people uh, you know, find it much easier to access services. Again, SMS has been used, you know, just the simple text messaging has been used quite effectively uh, to uh, communicate uh, with the citizens. And uh, for example, you can check your uh, um, uh, electoral data where your vote is registered, et cetera, through by simply sending a SMS. So, you know, in a, a lot of instances, you don't need very high tech systems. You can simply use uh, simpler uh, and uh, formats or interfaces that people are more familiar with, like, like SMS. But uh, even for more uh, complicated uh, applications, I think that as long as, I think one thing we need to do uh, much better is to use local languages. Uh, when we create interfaces, because in a lot of instances, it's more the language barrier than, than you know, along with the technology barrier that makes it very difficult for me. Imagine if you have a screen in front of you and you cannot read it, right? Uh, then you wouldn't know what to do with that app, even if you have installed it in your phone. So again, uh, we need an approach that is inclusive of people who cannot access services who uh, mediated uh, by technology, but at the same time, because we have a young population, 65% of the country are young people, they have enormous capacity to learn. And I think we should always have tutorials, guides, and uh, a supportive material to enable more and more people to use technology. A good example is, you know, you, you, you land at Dubai airport, right? And irrespective of who's in the plane, uh, now I increasingly see almost everyone going through the smart gates, right? Whether they are literate, illiterate, whether they are IT professional or a laborer, uh, you know, if you uh, provide space and opportunity for people to learn, um, you know, they can learn. But it's important thing is to have those options available, be inclusive, facilitate as much as possible. Okay, so when we talk about impediments towards innovation and reform in government, I mean, there will be many, you know, you could say stakeholders, or you could say many different variables and factors who would be resistant to any innovative techniques in the government bureaucracies as well. So how do you think, uh, what is the manner in which such, you know, irritants can be weeded out to try and make sure that innovation reform can actually take place? Yes, yeah, so first of all, the pressure has to come from the citizenry, right? So citizens uh, through social media, we have very vocal and very expressive uh, citizenry. Increasingly, we have an urban educated middle-class population. I think that's the real core group that provides a lot of impetus for change. So you look at not just Lahore, Karachi and Rawalpindi, but we have, uh, you know, the smaller cities are growing, expanding, increasingly getting urbanized, and people now have a shared worldview uh, created through diffusion of electronic and uh, social media. So people increasingly, there's a 
huge constituency that aspires for the same level of services delivered by the government as in the developed world, right? And that creates uh, the pressure on all government functionaries uh, to improve their performance, be transparent, you know, and be effective. So, so one thing is that there has to be that social, uh, social pressure because the governments and systems only respond and change if they are compelled to do so, right? Uh, otherwise, the inertia continues. Now, the uh, job uh, of uh, people like us is really to translate that demand or uh, social pressure into uh, genuine and, uh, you know, sustainable change within the governance systems, right? And um, I, and and that's where it's 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 a bit of back and forth because you are right. No one wants to change uh, unless you know they are forced to do so, or unless there is enough uh, either compulsion or uh, incentive uh, to change. So I think that given the mix of stakeholders we have, increasingly as we move towards. Um, the politics of service delivery increasingly as we move, uh, increasingly as we interact with, you know, more urban, middle class, young population, um, it will have to, you know, the mode of uh, governance and service delivery have to change. Unfortunately, one thing we haven't done well is that we've gone down the route of, uh, you know, accountability uh, in a sense that uh, rather than ensuring transparency and enhancing public accountability through the Right to Information Act, through setting citizen bodies like public uh, safety commissions, uh, through uh, putting out data uh, out uh, in the public through portals uh, and other digital tools, uh, we created a bit of uh, disharmony within the system uh, through institutions who really came wielding uh, the sword uh, in the name of accountability. Now that, you know, puts the whole system into, uh, into a fix because a bureaucracy simply stopped, you know, signing uh, the files and, uh, uh, and getting the work done that was necessary uh, to run the affairs of the state. I think we need to better balance our approach. Uh, we need to emphasize more on transparency and public accountability and uh, let uh, the institutions and the laws that we already have uh, deal with any irregularities um, um, and, and, and then uh, apply them fairly and squarely, right? So that there's no perception of any discrimination uh, or persecution. Uh, in in uh, in in using or wielding the the sword of accountability, and also we have to look at genuinely the predicament that a lot of government servants are in. We have to, for example, look at the salary gap uh, for comparable positions in the private sector and in the public sector, right? And make sure that that gap does not grow uh, enormously, because without um, adequate uh, incentivization and um, adequate um, salary structures and, and so on, uh, you can't expect uh, people to, uh, you know, remain motivated for uh, for very long time. And these, this is a service where people, you know, spend their whole lives in. 30, 35 years is, is the average duration of, um, of, of, of a person's tenure in public sector, right? So, um, you have to uh, make sure that uh, they have the support that they need, as well as uh, the pressure uh, to to perform, move towards performance management, um, and uh, deliver better services. So, with increased digitalization, you also have an increase in spike or, or a spike in threats. And you mentioned that Pakistan lives in a very difficult neighborhood. You have Afghanistan to the west, you have India to the east. Uh, there are hostilities with Iran as well. Um, so in light of that, there is this possibility that increased digitalization could result in cyber crimes or hacking, or you could say disruption from nefarious uh, elements. So how do you think a Pakistan can actually navigate through this delicate balance of A, initiating digitalization and governance, and also securing 
its uh, national databases and its national infrastructure from nefarious design. There's a lot of emphasis now on cybersecurity. We've already last year established um, a national center on cybersecurity, uh, putting together leading um, research organizations uh, and universities together. And different state institutions are enhancing and developing capacity for cybersecurity. Of course, data security is a very important issue. And as uh, we move towards greater digitalizing, not just public data, even our banking sector or security sector and so on, uh, needs, uh, you know, uh, good standards of uh, cyber security. Uh, but again, these are not things that no one else in the world has done. Uh, you know, various countries uh, have uh, achieved good levels of cyber security and so can we. Again, I think a technical solution is not as much of a problem than the political will uh, and consensus among stakeholders. Once we achieve that, uh, then, uh, you know, once there, once there is meaningful consensus, then, uh, you know, technical solutions will follow. Um, and there will be a, there will, there might be teething problems and, you know, a learning curve to go through. But uh, again, this is not something that is uh, undoable. Undoable. Mr. Adan, you mentioned, um, you could say consensus. Consensus can only take place if there's policy continuity. And we've noticed that in Pakistan, there's a lot of political turmoil. You also see governments being toppled, leaders getting arrested. And uh, you, you do witness this culture or climate of fear, which is, prevent, or which is preventing policy continuity to take place. So for that, you do need political stability for consensus. But that is some, something that has eluded Pakistan for quite some time. Absolutely. I, I think that we need to make policies that have greater ownership than just the uh, sitting government. And we need to develop a culture where uh, the opposition parties do not, uh, you know, scuttle uh, an ongoing policy simply because uh, it doesn't have their label on it, right? right? So if a policy was initiated in the previous, uh, by, by, by the previous government, um, uh, as long as, you know, it, it, it is delivering uh, its objectives, as long as uh, it is deemed necessary for, for, for the country, then it should be continued. And that will only happen if we, again, uh, where I started from, that it will only happen when we have consensus on uh, key policies that, that are absolutely critical for the, com for the country. And that consensus has to go beyond just the sitting government. Rather, it, it has to be multi-stakeholder consensus that involves the uh, civil and military side that involves uh, federal government and the provinces uh, the and uh, yeah a, a whole of a nation approach right now of course of course when a new government comes in they they have to review policies uh, through the lens of their manifesto their priorities uh, what they have uh, promised to the electorate now that's a legitimate uh, obviously uh, that, that that's important to happen but again, uh, you know, it's better that you refine and improve ongoing policies rather than completely uh, shutting them down and reinventing the wheel. And I think that goes back to how the policies are developed at the first place. If we are consultative, if we involve all the key stakeholders that need to be involved, it will become difficult for any government to shun that policy because even if they'll reinvent the wheel, they will reach pretty much the same conclusions, right? So I think we are making some progress in that respect. Um, and uh, you can see, for example, this, the social protection policy and yeah. the major social protection programs that we have, they have survived three changes in government, right? We should learn from that and replicate it in other critical sectors of national importance, so that we can con we can have continuity of policies uh, in those domains as well. All right, Mr. Adnan Rafiq, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's it's been a pleasure. Thank you. So that's all that we have for Islamba today on Think Tech Hawaii. You can follow us on social media pages for all the latest updates. Until next time, take care.